If you spent the early 2010s as a goth, punk, emo, or anything in between, you've probably heard this song. Or this one. Or this one. The mid-2000s were stuffed to the brim with bands that not only helped redefine alternative music, but alternative culture. Groups like My Chemical Romance, From First to Last, Bring Me the Horizon, and many more were composing siren songs that led disillusioned youth to a community and identity that many, including myself, still see as a defining part of their self-image decades later. But as well-defined as many of these bands were, even they weren't immune to the cultural wasteland of the early 2010s. While this usually meant genre shifts, side projects, and whatever alone by falling in reverse was supposed to be, the wildest, weirdest, most off-the-wall idea came in the form of a company known as GameLoud. GameLoud was an ambitious project that attempted to mix music with mobile gaming, developing over a dozen band-branded titles between 2013 and 2015, with games based around Census Fail, We Came as Romans, Crown the Empire, Bayside, and more. Less than 10 years later though, almost every single one of these games is lost. That's why, for this Lost Media Monday, we're going over one of the loudest genre's quietest failures. So tune your strings and leave a like as we strum along to the short story of Game Loud and their punk-based mobile games Lost to Time. Started in 2013, Game Loud, originally known as Game Changer World, was the brainchild of local New Jersey concert promoter John Desposito. Desposito had found success in 2002 with the Skate and Surf Fest, later spearheading the annual Bamboozle Festival as well. These concerts were originally meant to showcase emerging artists in the local punk scene, but eventually evolved into multi-stage spectacles headlined by bands like Fall Out Boy, Foo Fighters, and Paramore at the peak of their popularity. After the end of Bamboozle in 2012, Desposito aimed to continue making an impact in music and looked to the emerging culture of the internet generation as a guiding light for his next big move. Now, if you've seen my video on Family Guy Online, you already know what this culture was. The early 2010s were a lawless wild west, where everyone was desperately throwing anything they could at social media, casual gaming, and the power of nostalgia to see what they could make stick. Desposito would be no exception to this. With the stranglehold that small-scale games like Temple Run, Angry Birds, and Fruit Ninja had on every teenager with an iPhone, he saw the perfect opportunity to leverage this emerging gaming culture with the fiercely loyal fan bases of late 2000s emo. As explained by creative director Clay Graham, In the last few years, John had become aware of both the ever-growing mobile space, as well as the music industry's inability to advance with the fast-paced world of digital media as a standard. So after over 15 years of producing music festivals, his connections with numerous bands that had faith in his ability to take a leap into a world barely tread upon by music helped make the amalgamation successful. With a clear goal and a decade-long reputation in the industry, Desposito brought Game Changer World to the public in summer of 2012, with the goal of creating mobile games based on some of the best bands to ever sell shirts at Hot Topic. It may sound like a cheap cash grab, but the development of these apps was surprisingly thoughtful. The idea for each game came from the bands themselves, with GCW basing development around their ideas and concepts. It was also something bands seemed excited to be a part of, with multiple artists stating in interviews that they actually asked Desposito to be included after hearing about the company secondhand. Speaking about the development of his own band's game in a 2013 interview with Noise Creep, Census Fail singer Buddy Nielsen stated, John approached us about a band that I managed and getting them involved, and that sort of fell through. So we said, hey, Census Fail would like to do it, and we sort of went from there. The concept, the mechanics, and basic idea were ours. They did most of the work, but it wasn't like just, hey, make something. We gave them a pretty concrete idea of what we were looking for and what we thought would be cool. Despite fitting neatly into the cynical mobile gaming culture of the early 2010s, it was clear that Game Changer World was a project with heart and passion behind it. Unfortunately for the company, the best of intentions didn't necessarily translate into the best of games. Game Changer World's mobile games were first demoed to the public in early 2013, with Desposito appearing at local concerts, as well as his revived Skate and Surf Fest to promote their upcoming release. 
A video of one of these events showed fans able to try out early versions of games like Miss May Eyes Rumble, a side-scrolling beat-em-up, Census Fails Grindcore, a side-scrolling skateboard game, Forever the Sickest Kids MBK 3000, a side-scrolling Endless Runner, and We Came as Romans, One True Hope, a game that, I assume, had something to do with side-scrolling. First impressions weren't bad, but weren't especially enthusiastic. Games began releasing on iOS and Android in August of that year, starting with the titles based on Census Fail and Forever the Sickest Kids, as well as Mayday Parade's Face Off, a 2D platformer, Hops and Skate Madness, a Temple Run clone, T Mel's Trail and Travis, a Temple Run clone, and All Star Weekend's Restaurant, which had something to do with food. If it wasn't obvious, most of these titles were just reskinned clones of mobile games that were already extremely popular. And while soft plagiarism was hardly uncharted territory for the platform, the biggest thing stopping GCW from making an impact was that most of their games cost 99 cents, a steep price to pay when the games they were pulling from were already free. To their credit, Game Changer World tried to be more than just the games themselves, boasting a massive social media component that let players rank in online leaderboards and accumulate in-game points that could be redeemed on GCW's website. The prizes offered were pretty good, too, with rewards that included concert tickets, meet and greet passes, and skate decks based on the company's catalog. But if you're wondering how it felt to actually play these games, well, you're in luck because the person narrating this video is actually someone who bought Census Fail's Grindcore the day it came out. So you can trust me when I tell you it was an absolute mess. The boost controls were unresponsive, only one song played on constant loop during gameplay, and it spent its first week suffering from a game-breaking glitch where floors wouldn't load when moving between levels, leaving your character to freefall through the stage. When this happened, your session never actually ended, so you never actually finished a game, so you were never actually able to get points for the online rewards, or register your score on the leaderboards. Like, I remember this guy. I played constantly to beat his first high score, thinking every time would be the time I managed to get a full run in, and I never did. Did I do it after the game was fixed? I don't remember. All I remember is the, the frustration. frustration. While most of these bugs were eventually ironed out, the worst versions of these titles were unfortunately the ones that ended up with the most traffic. Fans themselves did a small amount of promotion leading up to release, but after the games were actually out there, nobody really had much to say, with most artists never actually mentioning them again. Despite the rocky start though, Desposito continued to push his project to grander heights. By late 2013, he would open the first physical Game Changer World location in Howell, New Jersey. This was a high concept venue that fused arcades with traditional event settings, hosting gaming tournaments, wrestling matches, and concerts from acts like Melanie Martinez, Dance Gavin Dance, and just about every band I liked too much in 2015. Following the venue's opening, the game development team would differentiate itself by changing its name to Game Loud in November. In 2014, Desposito elaborated on these changes, explaining that The idea began with Game Changer, but has now become Game Loud because we found that as the platform grew too broad, the games got lost in the mix of live events. Having them branded separately still lets them work together without being too confusing to fans. Through 2015, Game Loud would go on to release the Miss May I game, Crown the Empire's The Fallout, Bayside Blitz, Mod Sun's Trippy Hippie, Jake Miller's Jake Jump, My Ticket Home's Mutant Homicide Terror, and GC Derby, a kart racing game featuring memorable bands and imagery from the Skate and Surf Fest. Additional games were also announced for Real Friends, New Found Glory, Palisades, and Paradise Fears, with the We Came as Romans game still set to release as well. But in summer of 2016, those plans would quietly change when Game Loud went dark. The company stopped tweeting around August of that year, and hadn't mentioned anything about their games outside of a few odd posts near the end of 2015. Their remaining titles would go unreleased, with no official cancellation announcements coming from the company or the bands involved. There was never an explanation given for what happened to Game Loud either, and while I personally tried reaching out to both Game Changer World and John Desposito for more info, I never received a response. The Game Changer World venues, though, would live on, with Desposito opening a second location in Pennsylvania in 2017. The success would be short-lived, however, as both locations would shut down in 2020 during the coronavirus pandemic though Desposito himself would land on his feet and is currently planning a revival of Bamboozle set for 2023. 
After their quiet closure, titles produced by GameLoud would begin disappearing, leaving iTunes and Google Play stores before the end of 2019. Because of the low popularity of their releases, most games aren't even found on piracy sites either, leaving them completely inaccessible after their removal. Even those who had already downloaded the apps would eventually find themselves locked out, as the titles were never updated to be compatible with newer software, something I learned the hard way when I dug my old iPhone out to try and play Grindcore again. Ultimately, GameLoud's existence would be extremely ambitious, but also extremely short. While none of the games produced by the company were groundbreaking or especially compelling, they still stand out as a rarely inspired product in an uninspired era of gaming. GameLoud created an opportunity that most bands, especially B-list emo bands, could never even dream of getting otherwise. And while that opportunity may have only amounted to a few more drops in a bucket of Temple Run clones, its creative premise and ultimate integrity make it a project worth remembering, both within music and the world of lost media.